let's go ahead and get started with our last topic, and that's going to be the 21st century Ozarks, sort of as we, as we leave the topic and, or leave the subject of Ozark studies for a while, we'll just take a look at the Ozarks today and consider uh, some of the changes that have happened since some of the history that we've talked about, some of the issues that the Ozarks has, just various topics of interest in the Ozarks today. And before we do that, of course, we'll get to our famous person of the day. And today we've got this feller, quite an impressive mustache. Oh, is that Frank James? Not Frank James. Looks a little like Frank James, but uh, this is, again, as you figured out by this point in the semester, my famous Ozarkers are rarely really famous, uh, and this guy would have been well known at the time of his life and death, but uh, not as well known today. No, not, that's another good guess. It's not Nat Kenny, who was uh, the leader of the Bald Knobbers down in, in Taney County. Somebody said Cole Younger. It's not, it's not one of the... He was. He did have his, his own gang. It's, it's not a, a gang that's quite as recognizable as the James Younger gang. No, not Butch Cassidy. Well, we could probably guess for a long time and, and maybe not. Well, let's just uh, look at him in his demise. Uh, those, are, those are bullet holes, or at least, uh, at least they're uh, shell holes or something. I, I'm not, he may have got shot by a shotgun the way that looks. I'm not really sure, but uh, he was Bill Doolin who had his own gang. He uh, rode with the Dalton gang uh, for a while and then struck out on his own. He was an entrepreneur, so he founded his own gang. Uh, that's when you know you're on top of your game. And uh, uh, you can see there he didn't, like many notorious outlaws, he didn't live very long. He died in his late 30s after being arrested in Eureka Springs, Arkansas. And uh, escaping, he was gunned down in the Indian Territory or Oklahoma. And, uh, but quite a uh, notable fella in the late 1800s in an age when there was no shortage of outlaws, cowboy type outlaws. And Bill Doolin uh, was, was one of them, one of the desperate, desperados of the Indian Territory and the sort of cattle country out west. And he was from Johnson County, Arkansas, from the, uh, born and raised in the Boston Mountains down there. Was there a movie called The Wild Uh That was, uh, yeah, but I don't, I, it wasn't a Western, was it? I'm thinking, I'm thinking it wasn't. I don't know. But uh, there, wa there was a movie, I don't know the name of it, uh, there was at least one movie made in which there was a, a Bill Doolin character or a character based on, on Bill Doolin. Uh, it was a movie, I believe, about the Dalton gang that was made years and years ago. Uh, but, uh, was this common practice back then to take pictures of corpses? Yes, it was. That's why... To prove uh, they were dead? Or? Uh, I'm, you know, I really don't know exactly why they took pictures of them. I guess part of it might have been to prove to the public, if they were going to publish them, uh, to prove to the public that these people were actually dead. Uh, maybe to, you know, if there was reward money involved or something, they might want a picture if the body got stolen or something. I'm not really it's sure. Cleaned them up because I'm sure. Sure. The oh yeah, yeah. That's the cleaned, dead version. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and you've probably seen other photographs from that era of dead people uh, lying in coffins or, you know, just lying there like, uh, like he's doing, looks like on a lounge chair or something, you know. Uh, that, was, uh, that was a pretty common practice in those days. Yeah. So that's Bill Doolin. 
And our vocabulary word, somebody will know what bumfuzzled is, I'm sure. Yeah, confused. There you go. That's, uh, that's one that we still occasionally use. It can mean uh, to confuse someone or the state of being confused. I can be bumfuzzled or I can bumfuzzle you. Yeah, bumfuzzle. Yeah. I think uh, if I remember right, it seems like back when Bill Clinton was president, he may have used the term bumfuzzled like in a press conference or something. And the press made a big deal over what does this word mean, you know, and, and there's a whole, you know, the whole article that comes out on bumfuzzled or something. But it seems like, seems like that was the word. I know he used, I remember he used some kind of word that was kind of a southern odd word like this, and, and the press really had a heyday with it, trying to figure out what he was talking about. But, yeah, bumfuzzled. There are a lot of words that he says that the press had a heyday with. Right. Yeah, even words as short as is. <laughs> you know, that's, uh, yeah. What the definition of is, is. Yeah, yeah. Lots of, lots of hay could be made with, with uh, President Clinton. Yeah. Yeah, what do, you, uh, what do you think that means? Who, who's ever heard that in, the, in that context? Yeah, yeah, it's just another word for, uh, yeah, kind of, Strangest, craziest, honoriest. You know, you can you can use uh, beatness in a, in a lot of a lot of different ways. Yeah, yeah. And I still I've still occasionally heard people use that term in the rural Ozarks. You know, ain't he the beatnest thing you've ever seen? Yeah. All right. Any other words snuck in there? I don't think so. All right. We're going we're gonna to have one more. Uh, remind me if I forget to, to do our last famous Ozarker, and, and, we've, and we've got kind of a pronunciation guide if you want to talk Ozark. That would be our last thing that we, that we learned how to do, or one of the last things we learned. Okay, let's take a look at the 21st century Ozarks. Modern-day Ozarks. All right. First thing we'll mention, and we won't spend a lot of time on this because we've already talked about some of these issues, the demographics of the 21st century Ozarks, as you can imagine, are much different than the demographics, say, a century ago when the, when the 20th century was still in its infancy. We have, uh, we've had lots of changes. Some of these have happened just within the last generation. Some of them have been ongoing since the post-World War II era. And uh, one of the major demographic changes or effects of the post-World War II era has been the in-migration of retirees into the Ozarks. The Ozarks has become a very popular destination for retirees. For what reasons do you think? That's probably number one. Low taxes, cheap, cheap cost of living. Yeah, you can just get by on less in general. And there's, there's a lot of stuff to do, a lot of outdoor things. Yeah, yeah but the, uh, the retirees have been coming in, as I said, since really the post-World War II era. Uh, the 1950s and 60s usher in an age, and I believe we've talked a little bit about this before, usher in an, in an age when, for the first time in American history, lower middle class people, even working class people, are able to retire and to many of them move south. You have the beginnings of the Sun Belt as people leave the, the Rust Belt and head south. So you not only have cheaper uh, living conditions, but in some ways warmer living conditions. Uh, and there are you know, there are any number of advantages that you could say the Ozarks has over uh, lots of other places. But there are, uh, we know there are entire 
retirement communities in the Ozarks. We've talked about some of those. We, we've talked about Bella Vista Village just last time. Its beginnings as a resort town. Uh, since the 1960s, Bella Vista Village has been uh, the Ozarks' largest retirement community. Most of the people who, who moved to Bella Vista Village down in northwest Arkansas are retirees. And there are retirement communities uh, in many of the, the pure retirement communities seem to be down in the Arkansas Ozarks. Cherokee Village, Cherokee Village is one of the bigger ones. We had earlier in the semester, we had a student from Cherokee Village. Uh, uh, Fairfield Bay, uh, there are you know, several of them that have those sort of you know, subdivision-y type names. That kind of, a lot of them are located on lakes. Or in the case of Cherokee Village, they built a couple little lakes to go inside their, their village. And they advertised to people uh, kind of from St. Louis on north, especially uh, in the upper Midwest, retirees, and other places as well. So, and the, so retirees have managed to change demographics. And one of the things that retirees do is they, they bring... Uh, for instance, their religious beliefs with them. And in some of these communities, you've got churches that spring up that cater to retirees that you would never have seen in these rural Ozarks communities before. I know uh, in a place like Cherokee Village down in uh, Sharp County, Arkansas, uh, there was never a Catholic church in that county until Cherokee Village came in. All of a sudden, you've got a Catholic church. You've got a Lutheran church. There was never one there before. And so you have demographic changes, even in terms of religious institutions. You've got golf courses that tend to come with them. That's, that's sort of a, a prerequisite for a retirement community, have at least one golf course. We know that we've already talked about, when we talked about our uh, section on diversity in the Ozarks, the last generation has produced maybe... Uh, the most unexpected demographic change in the Ozarks, and that has been the influx of Hispanic immigrants, uh, Mexican-Americans, even some Mexicans, uh, and Guatemalans, Central uh, various people of Hispanic heritage who've come into the Ozarks, and we've, uh, we saw that those tend to be clustered around uh, the processing plants, in the poultry industry, and we'll see a map a little bit later on in this class of uh, where the poultry industry is prominent in the Ozarks today. And it's no surprise that those same areas, those same counties, tend to be the counties with large Hispanic populations, southwest Missouri, northwest Arkansas. So that has been, uh, that's an ongoing change in the Ozarks. The boom towners. And here, this is not really a specific group. What I'm referring to here is uh, especially a place like Springfield in southwest Missouri and a place like the Fayetteville, Springdale, Rogers, Bentonville area in northwest Arkansas, these kind of boomtown areas where, uh, where they've had prosperity, they've had business growth, and you've had people attracted to the Ozarks by uh, corporations, whether it's uh, Bass Pro Shops or Walmart or Tyson or whatever it is, people who come into the area to work, young, educated people, and you get this kind of boomtown effect in some places, uh, and which makes the Ozarks uh, much like other parts of the country that are prospering and, and are bringing in new people. So you get, a, you get yet a, another mix to the Ozarks. Of course, one of the concerns even in a place like Springfield and Bentonville and, and Fayetteville. Uh, one of the concerns today is that uh, that brain drain still goes on, that a lot of the most talented, most promising youngsters from the area still get educated and then immediately leave and many of them don't come back. So even in these places that by Ozark standards qualifies boom towns as prosperous places, you know, that can still be a concern, losing people. But a lot, of, a lot of new people continue to come in to the region. And that's especially true in a place like Bentonville, Arkansas, where just having Walmart there brings hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of people 
from all over the world and all over the United States uh, to businesses. Walmart is such a behemoth in the retail world that Walmart can say, okay, if you, you companies, if you want to work with us, uh, vendors, if you want us to sell your goods, put, put your goods on our shelves, you need to come to Bentonville and sell us on your products. And so all these companies from around the world set up offices in Bentonville, Arkansas, so that they can be right there where Walmart's headquarters is and, and, and deal with them. And so you get people coming from all over the place to work for those companies. One of the more colorful groups of the last couple generations, the Back to the Landers, the Ozarks, being a primarily a rural place, and again, a relatively inexpensive place when compared with a lot of other places, has attracted significant numbers of Back to the Landers, uh, counterculture types. Uh, this was especially true back in the 70s. That was kind of the heyday of the Back to the Land movement in the Ozarks. There were even a, a few communes that were established in the region. Usually they were short-lived, but there are still lots of people today. If you go traipsing around in the backcountry in the Ozarks, you'll find lots of people who are now middle-aged, especially baby boomer age people, who first came to the region maybe as many as 40 years ago as back to the land people. And uh, while many of them left, many of them stayed as well and have made lives for themselves here in the Ozarks. So that's another one of our groups. In some places, especially like the Harrison, Arkansas area, you've had other groups that aren't always as welcomed uh, when they come to the Ozarks. Uh, groups like uh, white supremacists, uh, groups that are a sort of your paranoid groups, uh, maybe militant type groups who are getting back in the back country somewhere uh, and bunkering themselves in. Uh, to wait for the end of time or Armageddon or whatever, whatever they're waiting on. And, and you get different groups like that. Uh, for one reason and another, the Harrison, Arkansas area in the last 30 years seems to have attracted you know, a few of those types of organizations. I think the, the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan may be headquartered down there somewhere and... Uh, you know, so you've even got, and, and I think part of this, part of the allure of the Ozarks for these groups is the perceived uh, lily whiteness of the region. And certainly if you, look at a, if you look at demographics of the Ozarks, as we've seen, especially since the early 1900s, after there were those episodes that, that ran many black people out of the region, uh, the region has been as white as any place in America, pretty much up until the last generation when uh, the Hispanic in-migration started, and that's changed things a little bit. But I think that's probably part of, was part, probably part of the, the draw for some of these kinds of groups is they were coming to a place that was, that was all white, and to them seemed, seemed like it would be a, a welcoming place. I'm not sure, but... Um, and then you have... Uh, Again, and these are relatively small groups of people and, and uh, don't all, they don't necessarily live in communes or anything like that. Uh, but there, uh, there are a, a good number of people in the rural Ozarks today who are uh, very strong property rights advocates. I'm a property rights advocate myself, but I, I'm talking in sort of militant terms, uh, kind of angry property rights advocates. And uh, so even, even kind of anti-government bunker type people, uh, you don't usually see those kinds of people around Springfield or a university campus. But, you know, you go to the right functions out in the rural Ozarks and you'll, you'll find, find some of these types of folks. And, you know, they're the same kind of people who sometimes find their way to the backcountry of Montana or North Carolina, you know, we've, we've got all kinds, and, uh, and some of them find their way to the Ozarks because it is rural and it is out of the way, and we do have a tradition of sort of letting people live 
and let live. You know, just kind of, you leave me alone and I'll leave you alone and do whatever you want to do and I'll do whatever I want to do. That's, that's kind of an old Ozarks tradition. That's why you don't have zoning laws in rural areas in the Ozarks. You know, whatever you want to do to your yard, that's your business. And I'll do whatever I want to do in my yard and we'll just agree to get along. Yeah. Of course, one of the hallmarks of the modern day Ozarks is the uh, significant number of Fortune 500 and other large corporations that are headquartered here, mainly in the Springfield area and in extreme northwest Arkansas. And we recognize most of these, of course, Walmart, the largest retail corporation in the world, started right here in the Ozarks in northwest Arkansas and is still headquartered in Bentonville, Arkansas, and had much, owes uh, much of its early success uh, to the Ozarks because most of those early Walmart stores were located somewhere in the Ozarks and then grew out from there. Certainly a story that uh, in many ways flies in the face of the stereotypes of the impoverished uh, backward Ozarks. Although many people today uh, have found ways to tie Walmart in with that stereotype of the impoverished backwards Ozarks. What's that? I'm, I'm sure the, the website is still up, but what's that? Uh, the one about Walmart people, what's it called? People of Walmart, where you know, people take pictures of unseemly looking people in Walmart and then post them and make fun of them and, and stuff like that. Uh, which to me seems like the most unchallenging thing in the world because, I mean, not, you know, I, we've, we've all been to Walmart and there's no, you know, uh, no, no real hardship in, in, in finding people to take pictures of there. But uh, Walmart is here. Uh, and uh, I don't know, it'd be interesting to know how many people in the Ozarks are employed by Walmart. I don't know what the figure would be, but it'd be a, be a major employer, probably more people employed by Walmart than maybe any other corporation in the, in the Ozarks. Sam, uh, Sam was a good, he was a good example of, it's probably a generational thing too, but he was a good example of uh, the the small town guy who becomes the multimillionaire, or in his case, a billionaire, who continues to live in the same house and drive the same truck and all that kind of stuff and, and sort of, but a part of that I think is just because you, you almost have to comport yourself in, in that way if you're gonna stay in your town. Like he, and, you know, he didn't move to, uh, to LA or New York or somewhere like that. He stayed in the town. And if you're gonna stay in the town, of course you're not gonna build a gigantic mansion and, and have somebody chauffeur you around in a limousine and stuff like that. So you gotta, you know, I think that's, there is a certain tradition to that in small towns uh, of staying one of the people, you know, being one of the people. But certainly Walmart has gone well beyond that now 20 years after Sam Walton uh, died. And uh, yeah. yeah, there are many things we could say about Walmart, most of them great. I'm hoping to get a sponsorship for this, for this, uh, for this class, you know, once it hits iTunes, but uh, it may not happen. We'll, we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm not selling anything. Yeah. But you may not want to take any classes of mine again. Well, all right. I'm also a big fan of chicken and yeah, Tyson Foods and we got George's on there too. That's another poultry company. It's a, it's a poultry, it's a poultry company. I don't, I don't know George's Steakhouse, but, uh, but there is a, uh, there, there is, it's a, it's a poultry company, George's. Yeah. Oh, there is a George's Steakhouse? Okay. I haven't, I haven't been to that one. Okay. Yeah. Oh, the, yeah. Well, this, uh, Tyson Food, another Northwest Arkansas company, another company that, that grows out of the soil of, of the Ozarks. Of course, this one uh, starts in the, 
1930s with the, the growth of the poultry industry in the Ozarks, and Tyson becomes the largest, I think, they're, I think it, they advertise themselves as the largest meat processing company in the world, not just poultry, but I guess just in general. Uh, though mainly what we know them for is uh, chicken and, and turkey, uh, but certainly a, another Fortune 500 company and one that uh, has been responsible for a lot of the demographic change that we've seen in the Ozarks. Uh, Tyson, as a poultry company, one of the first companies to bring in large numbers of uh, you know, unskilled, low-pay workers from, uh, from Hispanic backgrounds. So that's one. Of course, here in Springfield, we have uh, the headquarters to O'Reilly Auto Parts or O'Reilly Automotive, another big corporation, one of the larger auto parts retailers in the nation. I'm not sure where it ranks, you know, with Napa and, and these other places, but it's, it's right up there close to the, close to the top. And uh, J.B. Hunt, what's J.B. Hunt? Trucking. Trucking company. We've all seen the, and uh, we've seen the containers going down the rails and everything else. Uh, J.B. Hunt at one time was the largest uh, trucking company in the United States. I'm not sure if it still is or not, but uh, at one, back in the in the 80s and 90s, I think it was, it was the largest. J.B. Hunt, they're headquartered in Northwest Arkansas. Yeah, yeah. J.B. Hunt actually has a tie-in with, with Tyson and the other poultry companies. Uh, J.B., the actual J.B. Hunt, the man named J.B. Hunt who founded the company, got his start trucking uh, rice holes from southeast Arkansas, from the, from the rice country in southeast Arkansas to northwest Arkansas, and they used those as chicken litter as uh, they spread them out on the floors of the chicken houses. And the chickens would crap on them, and you know, they, then they'd then come in and scoop them up with front-end loaders and, and stuff and use the, uh, use the chicken litter on fields for fertilizer. But that's how he got his start in the trucking business was... Uh, was transporting those rice holes. And, uh, and so J.B. Hunt grows with the chicken business. Yeah, yeah have, have you ever seen these, these modern uh, hog farms? No. <laughs> yeah, they look, they look like, uh, like poultry farms from the outside. They're the big shiny buildings. You, you remember the, the movie Babe? You know, at the beginning, and they come in, they and they take Babe's mom off, and all this, and and they're inside. You know, they're inside this huge building and stuff like that. Well, that's uh, that's the way the the modern uh, hog business is. I mean, it's all it's become like the poultry business. These hogs are raised indoors, and they're you know climate controlled facilities and, and all that kind of stuff, and they don't go anywhere. They don't have any fun. Isn't that awful? Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. We. Uh, well, yeah. Most of most of us from Arkansas prefer our pigs of the Razorback variety. Uh, you know the the uh, uh, sort of free range hogs. You know that was a long tradition in the Ozarks having free range pigs. But uh, uh, yeah, nowadays your your mom and pop hog farmer. Uh, that you saw quite a bit in the Ozarks, even you know, 15 or 20 years ago, uh, has almost gone the way of the other extinct things. You know, that, uh, you don't see that very often anymore. I can think of uh, uh, there's one uh, kind of mom and pop hog farm uh, that I've uh, that's down on the Missouri Arkansas state line that I pass when I'm driving back and forth between Missouri and Arkansas, but I can't think of very many anymore. Yeah. Anybody raise hogs? Not really something you thought about. Oh, the, that's true. The, the hog farms, yeah, it, most of you have probably smelled a chicken house or a, a poultry farm and how rancid that smell is. Uh, well, uh, Butch is right, the hog farms smell worse. If you can imagine it. Yeah, you know, the, there, there aren't really that many 
industrial hog farms in the Ozarks uh, today. It may be something that's going to eventually catch on. Uh, you know, we think of a lot of them are back east, like North Carolina has a lot of hog farms, Virginia, uh, closer to the coast. Uh, but we don't have that many industrial hog farms in the Ozarks. Uh, but we may be heading that direction. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I wouldn't want to. I, I don't think I would want to do that. Uh, yeah, I, I have uh, shoveled knee-deep manure before, but it, it was uh, it was cow manure, and even that, you know, you get to mixing that ammonia stuff up, and that'll make you puke pretty quick. You know, so I can only imagine what the hog stuff will do. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, somehow we, we got from J.B. Hunt to that. I don't know who, who hauls that, but, uh, but I'm glad you brought that up because I, I hadn't heard about that, that hog farm yet. Uh, of course, here in Springfield, we've got uh, John Q. Hammonds and his hotel empire. Of course, he uh, made his fortune building hotels and, and resorts and, and things like that and uh, has lots of connections with the university here. George is another uh, poultry company and uh, Prime, what, what is Prime? It's a trucking company here in Springfield. Lots of other uh, examples we could talk about and we will talk about some of them as we go on, but just a few of the uh, Fortune 500 uh, level co companies or other large corporations that are headquartered here in the Ozarks. Uh, and then we've got some other Ozarks originals, things that, uh, again, kind of grew out of the soil, so to speak, of the Ozarks that often have something to do with the, uh, with the natural resources of the area or uh, the outdoor uh, activities of the area. Uh, Hammond's products. Has anybody ever been to, to Stockton, Missouri? up on the kind of western edge. You've been to the Hammonds place up there? Um, I, I've been to Stockton. You've seen it. Yeah, I, there's not really much else in Stockton. It's, it's kind of a one company town. Uh, but Hammonds is the largest uh, black walnut company in the world, I guess. I mean, they, they pretty much have a uh, monopoly over the black walnut business in this part of the country and, and for much of the United States, from what I understand. If, you, if you've ever paid attention to the, and some of you probably picked up walnuts in the fall. Anybody ever done that? No. Sell them? Got, got rich? My dad loves walnuts. He like, we'll put them in our driveway and then like, he'll be Drive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're not friendly. They're not as friendly as English walnuts when it comes to uh, getting them open and, and actually. And they do uh, stain. Yeah, they will. Uh, yeah, you you're advised to wear gloves and long sleeves when you're when you're picking these up. And yeah, you're not going to make any money picking up walnuts. You know, it's just kind of uh, Hammonds relies on our, you know, our good natures to pick walnuts up, give them to them for a few dollars, and then they do whatever they do and sell them. That's kind of how it works. Because almost all of the buying stations that you find in the Ozarks are, they all funnel their way back to Stockton. Uh, to the Hammonds company, yeah, and uh, usually in uh, September, October, that's the time of year when, when they start buying uh, walnuts. But it's it's a big business for them, and a lot of people do it. A lot of kids, you know, are sent out to the fields or to the yards to pick up walnuts and get dirty and stained and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Aromatique. Uh, which is headquartered down in a, a small town in North Arkansas, uh, makes decorative fragrance, uh, potpourri. It's w one of the big, uh, uh, I, don't, I, I don't know if they call it potpourri. I think they prefer decorative fragrance. But, uh, but they make smelly stuff, you know, good smelling stuff, stuff that you would want if you were heading to a mink farm or something to kind of drown out the, uh, the smell that you're going to, uh, but again, uh, kind of a neat, you know, unexpected business that you find in a small town in the Ozarks, uh, Heber Springs. 
Uh, we, of course, have Hershen Family Entertainment, which unfortunately is no longer headquartered in the Ozarks. The Hershen family moved their headquarters to Atlanta, Georgia a few years ago. But what do we know the Hershen family for? Right. We talked about them and the tourism, uh, the founders of Silver Dollar City, and they own all kinds of other stuff as well. I think they, oh, what's the Dolly Parton thing down there? Yeah, Dollywood and, and then the uh, Dixie Stampede. I think they own that. And the Branson Bell, I believe, is theirs. And they, and they have lots of uh, like aquariums and stuff around the country. It's a, it's a big uh, national corporation now that started down in southwest Missouri with uh, Silver Dollar City and, and Marvel Cave those years ago. Uh, but they are, uh, I don't know if even... If the Her I, I'm sure the Hershens have homes in southwest Missouri, but I don't know where their, their uh, permanent residences are. They may be in Georgia, I'm not sure. Uh, has anybody ever been to Terra Studios? It's kind of a neat place to visit. The next time you're around Durham, Arkansas, just stop in to Terra Studios. It's, uh, it's actually not very far from Fayetteville, probably 10 miles or so outside of Fayetteville, Arkansas. It's, uh, have you ever, uh, do you know what the bluebird of happiness is? Anybody have a bluebird of happiness? A little glass, those little glass uh, bluebirds. That's that's where those are made at Terra Studios. That's that they uh, uh, it was a glass blowing and other kind of crafty uh, studio down there, and it's been around for for years and years. But they made they got famous making these little bluebirds, and you can go in the studio down there, and the, there's a big like plexiglass window and you can watch them make the, they still make them by hand. You can watch them make the birds in there and they just, they make them in, in a matter of seconds. You know, this, this uh, hot blown glass and just kind of do, you know, whip it around and the first thing you know it's a bird. You know, I don't really know how they do it, but they know how they do it and that's what counts. So, uh, but that's Terra Studios. Ranger Boats, uh, one of the first uh, big successful bass boat companies in the country, uh, which was started down uh, in uh, Flippin, Arkansas, which is near Bull Shoals Lake, and uh, Forrest Wood was the the founder of Ranger Boats, and became, you know, it became sort of the bass boat of choice for years and years, uh, especially when, like the Bass Masters bass fishing tournaments were getting started and all that kind of stuff. It became a very popular thing. Again, related to the outdoors of the Ozarks, the, the, the sort of natural uh, benefits of the Ozarks. And of course, we all know here in Springfield, Bass Pro Shops and Tracker Boats made by the same company, uh, Johnny Morris and his story with Bass Pro Shops. Who knows the story of Bass Pro Shops? Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Johnny Morris's dad. Right. Yeah. Owned the uh, the Brown Derby liquor stores that you still see all around Springfield, and Johnny Morris got his start in the back of one of those stores. His uh, on Campbell. His uh, he convinced his dad to to let him try to sell uh, fishing equipment in there, and uh, it apparently. It worked out okay for him. Okay. Seems to have, yeah. I've been here, I've been teaching here for almost five years. This is my fifth, I'm finishing my fifth year. And that museum, that wildlife museum or whatever, was under construction when I, when I got here. And, and, and I thought, you know, my, uh, you know, I figured my kids would like it. And I thought, eh, you know, a couple years, maybe a year, we'll get to, we'll get to see that, but. I don't know if that, if that place is ever going to open it or not. It was. See, yeah. It was. Yes. They closed yeah. for renovations. Yes. Right. Yeah. It was open. Yeah. The museum part was open for a while. Yeah. Yeah. It is, it is uh, one of the longest building projects. And, you know, it's going to rival the pyramids at, at some point, you know. Well, the uh, Bass Pro Shops is, uh, is certainly has become a nationally known company now and you see bass pro shops all over the Everywhere. all over the country Number one tourist attraction in 
It's and and the store itself apparently is number is number one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I can remember. I can remember years ago. Uh, you know, people in my family who would come to Springfield just to come to Bass Pro Shops. I mean, this was before it became the Bass Pro Shops we know. But this was you know 25 years ago. I knew people who would come here just just to go to that store. You know, and then you get stuffed animals in there and. It doesn't get any better than that, you know. A few fish swimming around, yeah, that's that's quite a show. In there. You got you got yeah alligators in there. Yeah, you can. Uh, yeah, even if you don't spend money, you can go in there and have fun just looking around stuff. Yeah. My brother-in-law is a gun enthusiast, and they have a Oh my goodness! Yeah, they've got a whole uh, gun, gun wing. Gun. Yeah. Yeah, muzzle loaders and stuff. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah. Whatever you're looking for, chances are that it's that it's in there. Yeah, except, you know, they may not have cane poles. I'm not sure if they got anything like that. But they've got lots of stuff. No worms. I don't know if you can buy a worm there. You know, or menace. Uh, we know that the Ozarks uh, has, or parts of the Ozarks have been put on the map by some of these multi-billion dollar corporations that we have that people around the country know. Uh, but one of the, the leading industries of the region is still agriculture. And you don't have to get very far out of Springfield to, to realize this. You know, Springfield's a, the biggest city we've got in the Ozarks, but in 15 minutes you can be out of town and, and be in a cow pasture somewhere. Yeah, so uh, we, we know that the, really the, uh, the two big things today in the Ozarks, the, the biggest thing, uh, maybe not in terms of money generated, but in terms of widespread agricultural practice is uh, the farming of beef cattle. Anywhere you go in the Ozarks today, you're going to find cattle, and specifically beef cattle out there. Uh, and especially that's true in southwest Missouri, northwest Arkansas, uh, we've got some of the, uh, uh, it's one of the, the most concentrated beef cattle raising areas in the United States. Uh, they're just, they're everywhere around here. And uh, certainly the poultry business in terms of money generated may even be bigger than the beef cattle industry, but the poultry business is concentrated in places and in lots of places in the Ozarks you have practically no poultry industry and we'll see uh, we'll see that in a minute when we look at start looking at our maps uh, and obviously uh, the poultry industry is dependent on poultry manufacturing plants and those are not spread evenly around the region they tend to be concentrated in southwest Missouri and northwest Arkansas and one of the, the big stories of the last generation or so has been the decline in dairy farming. If you had lived here in the Ozarks 50 years ago, or even 30 years ago, this was one of the major dairy farming areas of the United States. Uh, and it, it was from the World War II era all the way up into the, into the 1980s. Uh, and over the last generation, there has been a major decline in dairy farming. And uh, we'll, we've got a few maps to look at here. Here are the leading beef cattle producing counties in the Ozarks. And you can see the, the darker, the shade, that, uh, the, uh, uh, the darkest counties are the ones you can see here uh, that have more than 40,000 head of beef cattle in them. So that's a lot of cows. And a lot of places in the Ozarks, cows outnumber people. And uh, you can see there, uh, this, uh, just for reference, since the counties aren't identified, this is Greene County. So this is what? Lawrence County. And that's Berry County. Yeah, here's Stone's the skinny county. And this is Polk County. So those are the three... Uh, largest cattle producing counties in southwest Missouri and then you got Benton County and Washington County in northwest Arkansas uh, but all these other 
Uh, gray shaded ones have at least 25,000 head of cattle. So, uh, but you can see there's a, a big swath of the Ozarks here where you have cattle farming, but uh, there aren't, you know, it's, it's, it's not as intense, uh, not as concentrated, uh, either because the, the land is more rugged or in some cases you've got, you've got uh, uh, national forest land that takes up a lot of space, so you have less private property to raise cattle on. That's the case down in here as well. And our next map. As I mentioned, dairy farming was at one time probably the, the leading agricultural activity in the Ozarks, in much of the Ozarks, especially here in southwest Missouri. But it has really declined in the last generation or so. Uh, there are still places, and this refers to the number of uh, dairy cattle. What's the difference between a dairy cow and a beef cow? Most of them that you see are, are black and white. And what, what are those called? No, not the black, the Holsteins. Uh, the black and white ones, the ones that are on the commercials telling you to eat more chicken, those are, are Holstein cattle, or, or Holstein, uh, but we call them Holsteins. And uh, the Guernseys are, uh, are going to be kind of tan and, and white. Uh, most of the dairy cattle that, that we have are, have spots on them of some sort. Uh, jerseys don't. Jerseys kind of a, a darker tan with a black uh, muzzle on them. Uh, and every once in a while you'll see like a, 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 a brown Swiss cow or something, which is another, as you would expect from the name, a brown cow. Uh, but, uh, but the main uh, dairy cattle are used for producing milk. Beef cattle are not used for producing milk. They still give milk, but uh, their calves drink the milk. Uh, we don't drink the milk. And beef cattle are, for the most part, raised for raising calves, which are then sold, sent to stockyards, fattened up when they get to 12 or 1,300 pounds or however big, whatever market they're heading for. Then they're slaughtered, and we eat them. So that's the main difference. If you're you know, a dairy cow, you're a working cow, you, know, you get milk twice a day, and uh, beef cattle, you're still working, but your main job is to raise calves and then give them up when they're about four or 500 pounds. You're, you're talking about, is it called the Ozark Mountain Dairy? Yeah, it's right, it's right on Highway 60, yeah, right. and that would actually be Webster County. Where that, yeah, it's in Webster County, and there's a, yeah, there's a dairy. Uh, I think it's one of those where you can go in there and, and watch. Uh, can't you? Uh, wait, now, the Ozark Mountain Dairy may be in Mountain Grove, is it? I'm not sure. Right. Yeah, there, there are two of those now. I think there's the one at Fordland, and then uh, they just recently, a couple years ago, opened another dairy that has the, where you can get the milk in old glass bottles and, and it's kind of, it's more a mom and pop operation. I think they opened one of those in, in Mountain Grove as well, uh, which is in Wright County. Yeah. And you can see here the, the leading dairy counties. This is Webster County right here. This is Wright County. Wright County is, is the leading dairy producing county in the state of Missouri, in the whole state of Missouri. And Webster County, I think, is second. And this, again, is Lawrence County over here. So these are the two main dairy producing counties in the state of Missouri. And there's a, at Norwood, Missouri, uh, which is right off of Highway 60, uh, there's, a, there's a sale barn over there that specializes in dairy sales, sales of dairy cattle. So it's still a big business over there, but even there, it has fallen off a lot from what it was you know, 20 years ago or, you know, or even 15 years ago. And I've got some statistics here. I, I got these, uh, let's see. Um, in 1949, uh, just to give you some idea, 1949 in Barry County, 
we'll start with uh, Barry County. You can see there is not even on the, you know, isn't even darkened on the map as a major dairy county today. But in Barry County in 1949, there were uh, more than 2,300 farms that sold at least some dairy products in 1949, over 2,300 farms. And today, uh, that number is roughly 40. I, actually, it's smaller than that because this is in the late 90s. Uh, in the late 90s, it was about 40. Uh, and the number of dairy cattle had declined from almost 19,000 dairy cows in Barry County in 1949 to about 2,700 in the late 1990s. So it gives you an idea of how, how much. Uh, here in Greene County, uh, Greene County was a, a major dairy producing county back in those days. In 1949, there were over 2,600 farms in Greene County alone that, that sold some dairy products, whether it was cream or milk, uh, butter, uh, whatever it was. And uh, today, or in the late 1990s, that number had been reduced to about 40 or so, about 40 or 45. And the number of cattle, dairy cattle in Greene County had shrunk from almost 29,000 in 1949 to less than 2,500 in the late 1990s, and it'd be less than that today because it's, you know, it's declined even in the last uh, 12 or 15 years. So that's, uh, in some places in the Ozarks today, the dairy industry has basically disappeared. You know, it's just not there. Uh, when, and just anecdotal uh, evidence, uh, when I was a kid, we lived in an area that, uh, or at least our little community had lots of dairy farms in it. And every farm that adjoined our farm, uh, the farm uh, we were the only farm in, in our little cluster that wasn't a dairy farm. All the farms that, that surrounded us were, were dairy farms uh, up until I was, you know, at least in high school and, and maybe even into, into college. And today, there, there aren't any. There's not a single dairy farm in, in my home community today. They've all, you know, closed within the last 20 years. And uh, in the entire county that I grew up in, there's probably not more than two or three dairy farms. So especially on the Arkansas side of the Ozarks, the dairy industry has just almost disappeared. And it's still holding on in some places uh, in Missouri, especially here in South Central Missouri, but it's steadily declining. What do you think has? Are big corporations buying up all the little ones? Uh, well, not necessarily, but big corporations are involved in this. Uh, what you've got today in a lot of places are these kind of corporate uh, dairy factories uh, where the, these, these huge farms that might have a thousand dairy cows on them. And they literally are milking these cows 24 hours a day. Not each cow 24 hours a day, but they're, they're, they have so many cows, they're, they're just, they're, you know, they're uh, milking 24 hours a day as they, as they kick them through this. And uh, a lot of these big farms in California and, and other places are just industrial farms. You know, the dairy cattle might live like cows do in a feed locker. You know, they uh, may not be free range. They don't go anywhere. They just kind of wait until their next turn to be milked. And then they're just... And so that's, uh, that economy of scale, those huge industrial farms have had a real negative impact on, on the family farm. Uh, there, there may be... I won't say, Butch, that there aren't any in the Ozarks because there may be. I've never, uh, I've never been to one. I've never seen one. And most of the dairy farms that are still uh, active in the Ozarks are, are still family farms uh, that, you know, they may be big family farms. They may have a couple, of head, a couple hundred head of cattle on them. Uh, but, you know, some of them are still small farms of 50 or fewer cows that they milk. And back in 1949, when I've got those statistics, a lot of those farms uh, would have been actual mom and pop milking two or three cows and selling the cream, you know, twice a week, uh, which would come into Springfield or Aurora or, or somewhere else and be made into cheese or, 
uh, ice cream or, or something like that. And then some people sold milk for the whole milk market. But, uh, you know, that's been one of the, the major changes in Ozarks agriculture over the last uh, generation or so, the decline in dairy farming. And dairy farms stink too, but not nearly, you know, to the extent as poultry and hog farms do and mink farms. I'm intrigued with mink farms. Millie's got me interested in, in that. I've always heard of mink farms, but I never really talked to anyone who, who knew about one. And then our leading poultry counties, and that is, there, there's my three-tone map. Uh, here you can see the, the leading counties down here in uh, Barry County and then Benton and Washington counties in northwest Arkansas. And you can see here, uh, the, black, the darkest counties, the black counties, are those that poultry sales generate more than a quarter of a billion dollars a year in. Uh, and these uh, statistics come, I believe, from 2007. The most recent stats I could get for this were uh, the agricultural census from 2007. And, uh, and you can see other large poultry producing counties especially down here. Of course, it's no surprise that the modern Ozark poultry industry really started in northwest Arkansas, and that's still the center of it today. That's where Tyson is headquartered, George's. Uh, there, are, uh, there are at least four poultry processing plants in the Missouri Ozarks that I was able to track down, and you can kind of uh, locate them by where these uh, counties are here. Uh, there's a Tyson plant in Monette, again, down in Southwest. Uh, there's a Simmons plant at Southwest City. Has anybody, anybody ever been to Southwest City? Down in McDonald County on the Oklahoma state line. Uh, there's a plant in Aurora, and there's a Butterball plant in Carthage, uh, which is over here. Uh, so all of those are in the southwest corner of Missouri. And then in Arkansas, there's, there's more than a dozen plants scattered around the Arkansas Ozarks. Uh, many of them are owned by Tyson uh, and by other companies like George's, OK Foods, Ozark Mountain, Pilgrim's Pride, uh, different companies like that. But you can see uh, some of them are located down here in the Arkansas River Valley, uh, several of the plants up here, and then uh, the town of Batesville, which is right about here, has a couple of plants, and so that's why you've got uh, this little corner of the Ozarks that's involved in the poultry business. But you can see the vast majority of counties, the, the interior of the Ozarks, the poultry business is basically non-existent in these places. So they're just waiting on somebody to found a factory, a plant in one of these places. All right. Well, let's go ahead and take a break. And we will come back and talk a little bit about uh, some extractive industry. And we'll talk some politics and uh, stuff like that.